So, uh, for this episode, I don't know if we can insert Crime of the Century lead in. That, that's a great uh, song that we'll use from Super Tramp. Or School. It's so funny that you listen songs. to Super Tramp. What are those Tramp? three songs? Crime of the Century or School is a great tune from... Uh, from uh, Super Trump. So what, what finally happened with the circle Take here? a look at my girlfriend. She's the only one I got. I'm just going to buy, I'm going to buy like 3,000 shares of Tesla right now. Where's it at? 160 something? 170? Are we rolling? Because we should be rolling. That's what I'm saying. We, we need, we need I got 2,000 shares of Tesla. Right we'll just do a contest. Name the, name the, uh, name the name of this podcast. Yeah, we're gonna have the the dollars in ten seconds. Getting schlocky with Schmenzen. Let's go. Uh, let's go. Welcome everybody. Stock I... schlock. <laughs> How many podcasts are recorded with somebody actually day trading at the same time during a Fed announcement? Dude, that would be great. Oh my god, we need like a huge move where you lose everything. It would be perfect. <laughs> well, well, I am um, down to three hundred and thirty dollars. I'm down. Perfect. Where did you pop that trade in at? Um, I got filled at one seventy five sixty three. No, where, where we should do a trading show? Where, where, uh, what brokerage are you using? Centerpoint. Which one? Centerpoint. Huh. All right, everybody, welcome. We don't have a name for the show, but I've organized. Uh, is it okay to have done that, Riley? Start. I uh, have really. You know, it's been time, right? JC, I, I introduce everybody, but um, I've wanted to do a show, more personality. No offense to uh, myself with my doing my own show, Panic with Friends, but a little more personality. The only way to do personality is to add some video and to have some very close friends. Uh, people may not know we, we're such close friends, but to have some close friends uh, inspired by a lot of other people doing cool podcasts, including our friend Josh Brown, and the compound guys, uh, and you know, being longtime friends uh, with JC Peretz is here, and Phil Perlman, and uh, Riley kind of running the production. We want to do uh, put together a weekly uh, market show. None of this, the fluff, uh, a lot of guy talk, a lot of father talk, um, a lot of uh, <clears throat> discussions about mistakes, wins, ideas. More, a little more real time. We're not. We're not going to. Uh, we're going to. We're going to be in the moment here and post these live, and um, get them up quicker. Today it's our first show. What is it? It's uh, February two. What do we got? Fe February one. February one in the afternoon. Fed just announced. What did the Fed do? Bucks in Tesla. What the? Uh, you're up. What What did the Fed do? I, I don't know. Tesla's up a point since I bought it. We have it on record, right? You guys saw that. Anyway, yeah, so I love how Lindsay just gets right off the bat. You know how when Lindsay has events, he likes to do his like stand-up comedy at the beginning? That was it. That was pretty good. So you are listening to, uh, we don't know the name. We're thinking Finn Twits, Cash. What Dash, is the name of this podcast? Yeah, we need something with SEO. Help us name it because we have Help no idea. So I wanted quickly, a little introduction. People may not know, but you know, we go back 10, 15 years Phil and I, 20-something, uh, all the way back to Yahoo Finance. And we've got a lot of stuff in common from uh, stock twits, all-star charts, helping each other out, building a community, um, being there day one at FinTwit, uh, starting stock twits, the cash tag, building JC, uh, JC building his business. We've got Riley running production, who started out, I think, as an intern at stock twits, Riley. Uh, I started out as an intern with JC and then full time at Stock Twits. Yeah. Well, so I started at SMB. First. Hold on. Riley, you were at SMB before All Star Charts, right? I was at SMB before All Star Charts, yes. There you go. No, so so you I, met him at, I met him at Riley out in Cali, Colorado, that time he went to ASU. So Riley yeah. is trying to uh, re reimagine his life and get on the tour. So he's working, helping me around the office here, around events and, and media and growing our, our media brand. So the first thing we said is like, let's put Riley to work. Let's get everybody in a room and start talking about markets and behavior and family and media. Uh, from our weird point of view, we've got enough people that want to uh, listen in and we'll, and we'll test this out. So a little background, Phil and I met maybe on Fred Wilson's blog. 
Fred Wilson's blog way back in the day, in the all. Way back in the day, 05. Fred, um, Phil, you were 8 Fat Swine. Just walk people through what 8 Fat Swine means. That's I had an early blog, 8 Fat Swine. Uh, 8 Fat Swine goes back to the tulip bubble and uh, what uh, what somebody was willing to pay for one uh, Semper Augustus tulip bulb, if I recall correctly. <laughs> so it's a lot for a little bulb. I mean, you could buy like, you could buy 10 of them for 99 cents online now. And back in the day during the bubble. So it was just the tip of the hat to the absurdity of human behavior around markets and everything else. And it was an early blog. I had, I had somebody of mine build it like from scratch. Google I, mean, I think WordPress had only been out there. This goes way back. Um, and so we were both hanging out in the comments section uh, of Fred Wilson's blog. He, does he still have comments on there? I don't think he does. Or We had both invested in Discuss, which was a D-I-S-Q-U-S, which was like... Social you know, commenting. The right? original Twitter, basically, or Facebook, right? Like the original... You guys need to also reiterate when you guys talk about Yahoo Finance, you kind of just like you know, went right through that. Kids these days think that Yahoo Finance is like a site and everything like that. These were message boards back in the day. I think you need to, the kids don't know about the message boards. Can you explain to them what that used to be like? Because you want to talk about, you think Twitter's a shit show. You should have seen the Yahoo message boards back in the day. I think it inspired, like, so Yahoo message boards, what people don't know, we talk about it occasionally, is... What was amazing about Yahoo before, you know, street.com and then Yahoo Finance around the same time, I think, Phil, just correct me as we go. But Yahoo Finance was the original retail, probably the original retail Internet spot, right? Kramer was more of a paid service at Real Money or street.com. Yahoo Finance comes out and they are like the center of the financial universe. And really what was fascinating about it was 20 minutes to late quotes. So like... Kids think now like they're complaining about their buy button not working and their GameStop button. In 1998, 1999, we were literally trading on Daytech and E-Trade and Schwab with 20-minute delayed quotes, and we thought we had an edge. Uh, so we've come a long way, uh, but that was the era. And Phil was on the, the Amazon board. Where were you hanging out? Yeah, you were on the Amazon yeah, board? Yahoo Finance message board was like – if you trace social back, you had Usenet, which is super old school. And then you have Yahoo Finance message board was like the first social finance. Mm -hmm. And it was just so polluted. If you think Twitter's bad, it was just so polluted. But there were some intelligent people on there. I met some people on there that I'm still friends with today. Well, Mr. Uh, Pink, very... Dan Lowe was on there. Dan Lowe was on there back in the day. Uh, Gregor McDonald was on there. Yeah. And uh, and so there was this whole thing. And uh, it got me interested from a, a behavioral and psychological perspective in online communities very, very early. And then, of course, uh, you know, stock twits and just being involved with that early on uh, with you, uh, Howard. But in between that, there was uh, uh, Fred, you know, was had this blog. And he had discuss on there and it was just this incredible, and he was on there too. So he was oh, yeah. part of the community and that really fosters the best components of it when the leader is there and interacting. And uh, I think we met there just, you know, goofing around and then met in public. Uh, I remember, I remember walking around, uh, walking around the village with you eating, uh, raspberries you know you had like four boxes of raspberries and that's going you know, like he was on a hey jc he was on an all raspberry diet way before we were doing keto bro no, no, no. let me just get this because i was catching riley up on the old stories last night and he couldn't even believe it because riley is now fucking somehow his doctor is you and i was explaining to him how bizarre that is because as much as i love you and trust you like you were a lunatic and yeah. You know, you've taken this cleanliness, uh, behavioral health thing to a new level, which is super interesting. But at the same time, we're not going to give you any credit. So I was telling um, Riley how that we used to, the stock to its office was also my bedroom and uh, in New York. And that you and I would go midnight for a falafel at my moons and then have a crepe on the way home. And Riley just, that was blowing Riley's mind that like, we would be packing carbs at like midnight 
uh, on a Tuesday. And JC can appreciate that because JC's a food lover too. We're all kind of on a little bit of a health uh, lean uh, lifestyle these days. You two more than me. You three more than me. But like in the day, Phil, like it's 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 a it's a journey. Dude, uh, we were we were younger. People fail to realize is that this whole like FinTwit thing that you know this is global amazing network. You know I've been I don't know twenty different countries around the world and met people in all of them that like I've met in social media. I mean it really is amazing. But all of this started with in, as happy hours in Soho. Like, yeah. That's that's what this was, right? It was, you know, there weren't that many blogs back then. I certainly didn't have a blog yet. You know, mine came because it seemed like everybody around me had a blog. Remember? Like, Perlman's like, JC, you should have a blog. And, like, Josh Brown is like, JC, you should have a blog. And I'm like, I don't know how to do that. Like, I don't know how that works. And then Perlman's like, here's a username and a password. Just start talking shit. I was like, all right. So, and where, who came up with all-star charts? You or Phil? Honestly, like back in like in 07, uh, you know, we were out late and, um, you know, we were boozing in New York City. I was in my mid-20s and I got home late, you know, pretty banged up. And all-star charts, I was like, oh, that, that was like a good name. I went to GoDaddy. I bought it for like six bucks or whatever. I was like, maybe one day this will come in handy. But then years later, Phil's like, oh, what should we call it? I was like, well. One night I came home drunk and I bought allstarcharts.com. Maybe we should use that. He's like, done. We have so many domains. I, I still have charts gone wild. I don't know. We have, uh, there's charts. That was a good one. Yeah, that was a good one. I don't know where that's I held. The, I have the Rim Greeper. Remember the Rim Greeper? It was going to be like a, like a Perma Bear blog that was just going to troll Perma Bears. Here's, I remember that. We designed that. It was like black with like, a, a, you know, like the Grim Reaper guy. I remember just, we designed yeah. that, man. We got like three quarter. We never launched it, but we got, we got pretty close. Stuff. Like just like gold, 2007. Like world, short everything and just control. <laughs> and we had a guy who was going to edit it. We had that guy who had like the, uh, you know, the bad guy from the Batman mask. That was his avatar. He was, and he was a strange dude. He was a real perma bear. JVs with zero edge. So Phil and I. Exactly. We were going after the zero hedge crowd. There was a there was a moment, Phil and I. We were we had a lot of spare time, even though I don't think we used our our. We were growth hacking growth hacking back in the day before Twitter, basically, and before YouTube, or as YouTube was before Reddit, and before stock twits. We were just starting stuff. So I remember Phil and I would log on to Twitter, and there was a there was a moment in time when Twitter was cool, and you could open up, you could just sit on anybody's name. Remember Phil and we, Phil and I. Bill and I were sitting on every CNBC person's Twitter. CNBC didn't believe twi in Twitter. And Phil and I, at one point, were 12 of the hosts on CNBC. Remember that, Phil? And we would have these discussions using co-tweet. We would be, like, having arguments as if the CNBC hosts were having arguments. And we were trying to keep track of the arguments because we would log in. We would be just be – who you were like – it was Ron DeSantis complaining about Dude. the – of uh um you know what it was i remember this money honey it was it was shannon freaking got like he squatted on like six of them and he and he gave them out to us yeah, yeah i think i think it was shannon he was like he calls me up what's that give him a shout out brian shannon just published his book i got brian it. I got shannon it's a good color good color beautiful right it's gorgeous yeah. gorgeous book yeah i got it too right here dude oh, yeah. it's oh, oh that's the old one so remember that phil so we were squat i was uh remember i was i was um bernie madoff for a while on twitter there was bernie madoff we had all of them and it was back before anybody was on there it was pre it was a pre-oprah era yeah it was pre. it was before oh it was before oprah oprah kind of blew up twitter by the way it was before oprah came on and uh, yeah, and Brian Shannon calls us up, and he's like, "Dude, I got all these CNBC guys. I, 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 I'm sitting on all of them. Who do you want?" And I was like, "Ron and Sana. I think I got Ron and Sana, and just mocked them." Yeah, got in a fight between Ooh. Honey Honey and Ron and Sana. She, someone was complaining about someone's breath, and we were all the characters, and they didn't understand what was going on on Twitter because people were like, thought there was a real CNBC fight going on. And we were just all logged in as CNBC characters. So those people that like are complaining, that was the wild west of FinTwit, right? Well, there remember, were no what's rules. What's interesting is that there, there are, were no rules. Nobody cared. 
we, we got that out of our system and now we're adults and now we just profit from the whole thing. But like, and now you have adult people that are doing that, right? Like you see that yeah. sort of thing now, more creative and in different ways, but basically that just like you got too much time on your hands and you're just messing around with new tools. You know, I feel like for us, like it's hilarious watching that, you know, cause I mean, you know, we have like families and like, we, you know, we got other things to do now. Uh, now well, it's proper marketing. Yeah. Proper, it's proper marketing. Proper marketing. So you look at people. JC has, tw- you have three kids, you have twins, so congrats. Thank you. Uh, by the way, up five grand in this Tesla as we've been recording, just for the record. <laughs> five grand, dude, like 20 minutes. Did you peel a little back here, or this is like a- I haven't sold any thing? yet, literally. I'm, I'm, I mean, the market's squeezing as we're recording. This is 3, uh, 3 p.m. on Wednesday. I bought a few thousand shares of Tesla. Oh, uh, here we go, giving it back. Anyway, so, uh, you know, that's just- this is this is real life, you know. I could give it all back in the next twenty minutes. I have before. I'll do it again, you know. So, so we're going to put a trade on every every time we do a podcast. Yeah, we put a trade on at the beginning of the show. Every time. Well, there's action right after the Fed did their thing, so things are moving. So it just so happens, like usually Wednesday afternoons are kind of boring anyway. You know, not this time. So let's just a little background, on everybody. So JC, you're living where? So I live in Eastern Pennsylvania. I'm in, uh, you know, just outside of Bethlehem. So I hop over to New York City whenever I, you know, whenever I need to, maybe a couple of times a month. Uh, I grew up in Miami. I went to college, played baseball at Fairfield University, started working in New York, met these clowns, learned a few things about, uh, you know, markets and, and life and investing and all kinds of things. I mean, you know, when I, when I talk about the people that have helped me most, you know, throughout my career, the two of you are right at the top of that list and a few other friends of ours for sure. Um, you know, but you guys, I mean, you know, whatever I've needed anything, I call Howard. I was like, Howard, bro, what do you think? He's like, don't do it. And then I do it anyway, you know, stuff like that. You know, Perlman's one of those guys that, you know, when, you know, throughout the time I've known him, you know, when I listen to Perlman, like they, I'm usually glad I listen to him. And then when I don't listen to Perlman, it's like, fuck, I wish I had listened to Perlman, you know, Usually that's the, you know, the theme uh, with Pearls. And what's cool is that Riley worked for all of us. Riley worked with Phil. Riley worked with Howard. Riley worked with us at also charts multiple times, I think, right? Didn't you work yeah. with us a few different times? I did. Uh, so Riley, um, you know, when I agreed to, to, to do a podcast with Pearlman and Howard, I didn't know Riley was going to be a part of it. I would have said yes faster, actually, had I known, you know. Wow. I appreciate that. <laughs> sure. So, so yeah, and so we all go way back. You got now two twin. You have twins, Fabrizio I and Liglia. I got two what, what the name? pictures. Fugazi and Fugaza. What are the names of these two kids? Giuliano and Cristiano. Yeah, so a couple of a couple of, uh, of beef eating Italian boys in the basement. And oh, uh, what's that like? You're playing. You got three now. So what is like? What is it like with two babies? I mean, just it's just. Just imagine just like chaos, 24-7 chaos. And then sometimes it kind of just like calms down and it's like, wow, it's really quiet. And then it goes zero to 60 real quick, you know. So like when I work, like you guys, you know, I'm multitasking, you know, a day trade and doing this podcast at the same time. Like this is my vacation time. Like this is like my off time of like the real work, you know, that starts after the market closes. It goes ding, ding, ding. Now I got three crazy kids screaming. You know, that's when the real work starts. So this is this is vacation, baby. Just give it to me. So you got the girl and two boys, right? The twin boys. By the way, he's doing great. Like he's doing amazing for having uh, 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 one kid and then just having twins. And uh, you know, he, he he's still getting it done. He looks great. JC, you look you look you great. You're doing your great. I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy for you. This is an early plug of your coaching. What's well, that? Is this an early plug of your coaching services? Well, you know, I've been I've been just providing him feedback and counsel for a while. But yeah, he's doing great and it's all because of me. No, he's just doing great. He's doing and great. Then, Phil, Phil, you've lived life with one eyebrow. What is that like? Dude, my whole life. It's yeah, like, what uh, is is it, am I, let me ask you this. Here's a question I have because Are I don't you, know for sure. Am yeah. I Bert or am I Ernie? Because I know I'm one of the two, but I, I and I never I always get confused who's who. Like who, which one? Meanest, which one's the one with one eyebrow? Is it Bert or Ernie? What's the meanest thing someone's ever said to you? Meanest? Not counting yeah. me because I was I was mean a lot. Dude, the worst things were when I was in high school and I went to a private high school, mm-hmm. and there was only like four Jews there. <laughs> so like all of a sudden, I was the Jewish kid, 
And it was just like, I remember, I remember one time I was on, I was playing JV basketball and there was another Jewish kid on the team, this kid Cher and uh, the coach and, and me and, and me and Cher were like scrambling for a loose ball. And the coach was like, Hey, uh, you guys shouldn't fight. You go to the same synagogue. And it was like, dude, what the fuck? What, what the fuck is that, man? <laughs> like today, that guy would be fired. Back then, it was like I could, you know, Back in the day. it was just toxic. So, <laughs> you know, that that was probably the worst. But the eyebrow stuff, I mean, that's not really a big deal, you know, at this yeah. point. Plus, you've only you've only made that joke like 300 times in my life. So Do people hear it only heard it once. So hang on. So, uh. So tell people what you're, you're doing. You're, you're, so I've been involved with markets and, and financial media for a long time. And I, 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 I resigned uh, in Q3 of last year and, and created, uh, I, was a, I was a CMO at, at, at Osprey Funds. And uh, I went and I just started, I, I, I went on a health journey. Like I was really, like you were saying at the beginning, I was really not doing well. You know, I was overweight. I'm drinking too much. And, and about four or five years ago, I embarked on my own health journey, got myself into great shape and uh, really uh, uh, fit and, and lost a ton of weight and, you know, running half marathons and all that. And uh, so I decided to start a, you know, start a company where I could uh, educate and help people get healthy, not just, you know, for the short term, not just for like six months or, you know, get abs, but like to plan for like, you know, life planning. So, you know, you have sort of wealth planning and health planning and they go together. So I've really been focusing mostly on the advisory community because I think that there's a great parallel there and there's a great interrelationship there uh, with, you know, people who have their wealth game down, like they're on a great path with 529s and 401s and all that, but that don't have their, their health game together as much. So that's kind of that it's called the Pearl Institute and, and, and uh, just a little tease me and uh, JC are working on a joint venture. Uh, so the Pearl Institute and JC Peretz are working on a joint venture for an online, uh, online uh, uh, community and educational product that we're going to be launching uh, in the next oh, six weeks or so. Uh, really exciting. It's exciting, but I like it. It's a, far, a far cry from the, Late nights at Blue Ribbon, uh, Howard. Yeah, no, right. And All right. Well, I'm fried chicken and right. I'd meet Howard like at midnight at Blue Ribbon in Soho for fried chicken and bone marrow. Remember, we yeah. eat the bone marrow on a little bread. You know, drinking wine till all hours of the night. Like we had, we had no responsibilities. Like what was we had responsibilities? I was just running. I was running from. There's a difference between having responsibilities and owning your responsibility. <laughs> So those were tough, you know, starting stock twits, kind of like uh, that web two was a pace. We'll get into all this over the next months, but like web two Dude, was that a great pace. place in the village was yeah. pretty serious though. Well, the no, pace so of web you, two. Let's, let's give some perspective. People are like, when was this? This was like, this, this all, everything you see here, if, for people listening out there, like everything you see here, this global fin twit was sparked by the great financial crisis. Yeah. That's what started all of this. Uh, you know, finally, everybody realized we can't trust the banks. This is all their fault. They suck. We can't trust the media. They missed it. They're a bunch of liars. There are better ways. And there were a few blogs at the time, like Ritholtz and, like, you know, Business Insider was doing some stuff. There was already because you didn't need the media. You know, you didn't need the banks. You could go straight to the source. If you wanted a, a, an economist, go to a great economist. If you wanted a venture capital guy, you go to the best venture capital guy, Fred Wilson or whoever, right? You know, you, you had the source. I was a huge Barry Ritholtz fan. Like, now it's funny because yeah. me and Barry are friends now. And we talk all the time. But, like, I, had, I was a huge Barry fan. Yeah. No, it's a different time. And I remember hitting up who was banned from the industry, Phil knows this. He was banned from the industry. He started this Google blog called, uh, it was a blog spot. It was like a long, it was like long only research on tech. I remember emailing him being so excited. I invested, I sent him a term sheet and I invested in, I was one of the first investors. Cluster stock, right? Wasn't that the beginning of it? Cluster might stock. have been Whatever happened the, to that. The But his blog was called The Why. It was something, it was very good research. Listen, he had a bad Right. He got into it with the politicians and he was like the poster child. He was like, he was the whipping boy uh, for the e-toys. You know, when he was, he, you know, people don't remember this. They, they make fun of GameStop and AMC. But man, back in 1999, 2000, when that, when the bubble came down, Henry was like the bitch 
of, of media and Wall Street, Henry was the guy that they put the whole thing on, right? Mary Meeker, Michael Parekh, Henry Blodger, but they, they, the walls came down on Henry because he went, in, he went at it with the politician who got beaten up, I remember, in the end, sexual stuff. But Henry went at it. He got barred from the industry. He was the, he was the whipping boy of Wall Street that had, had sent out, like, strong buys on eToys, but back channel into email was like, this is a turd. Uh, and he, you know, for good or for bad, he got, he wasn't allowed to even blog. Like he had, a, he was banned from the security industry and he started this counterculture blog that I got in on with Ali Insider back in the day. So it was like that. This here's his, blog. here's his, here's a headline from, uh, December 17th, 98 shares of Amazon rocket Wednesday after CIBC Oppenheimer analyst, Henry Blodgett lifted his long-term price target on the stock to 400. When I think, but there was also an eToys one where behind the scenes he was sending emails, get the hell out, and he had a strong buy. So that's what he got banned for. So, so people that I need to know some history, this shit's gone on before. So as JC is saying, we'll get right into today's stuff and we'll come back to history each episode. But what JC saying, which rings true today is FinTwit came out of, you know, I started it before the GFC stock twist, but FinTwit came out of the GFC. Um, and we've had a long bull market. JC, will, JC has been, you know, last seven, eight months saying we're in a new bull market. I, I'm tending, I'm a, I'm a trend follower, so I'm slow to get to these new, newer things. I'm waiting. Oh, but I think, I'm a trend follower too. What do you yeah, mean? yeah, but you, you were, you're pretty early in nailing some of these bombs. Yeah, I'm, the trend changed. Yeah, I feel like we're, we've, ent- and again, this is why we're talking. I think we're entering some kind of new fangled bull market. Um, and the last time we had something like this, well, there's two. There was, there was 2000, March 2020. I mean, with the when I started panic with friends, which was like March 13th, 20, 2020, when the VIX was like 70, 80, 90, and I said, listen, there's some. If you're not going to buy stocks today, you may never. You shouldn't probably ever buy stocks. Um, and we went on that great. You know, we bought them like two, three weeks later. Um, last year was maybe my worst, you know, it's, it's been a great run, but it's probably, you know, end of a trend, my worst couple of years in the, in, as an investor in terms of just a trend follower getting run over and all these trends topped out. But as we, as we look at two top, 2023, we're in February, there's something going on. And the tools of today are different than what the GFC brought, which was Twitter, stocked with Reddit. Now you have uh, we're using what we're using here at Riverside. A couple of Israeli or four Israeli brothers built this. Uh, you've got podcasting. You've got still Reddit, stock to its Twitter. You have Discord. You have Telegram, WhatsApp. I mean, it's so distributed. It's just water at this point. So it'll be interesting to see this new bull market. I think it's more, you know, segregated. We're going to have all these smaller groups and, um, you know, it's going to be a much slower pay. Web 2 is this explosion of, AWS, App Store, uh, um, smartphone, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, those trends are not going away. They're just played out. Like everybody's, the the, sh- you know, the story's out on that. This next bull market, which we're here to talk about and over the next months ahead, is going to look different. You know, the speed will look different. Um, the communication will look different. <clears throat> the valuations will probably look different. The macro is different. Um, the world is different. But um, JC was out eight, seven, eight months ago saying maybe we bottomed or have bottomed. So I want to get into that. So here we are. It's, it's February uh, 2023. Let's start with um, the January effect. Maybe JC lead. What are we seeing? So the January yeah. effect historically is that small caps outperform large caps. Right. Sometimes over the years, that's come into December. Uh, But the January effect, you've seen it. Small caps have definitely um, outperformed large caps. I think the the biggest thing about January for me is that we saw the trifecta. So you got the Santa Claus rally. It came. Stocks are supposed to do well the last five days of the year, the first two into the new year. That's perfectly normal. When they don't, that's not a good thing for stocks historically. Um, it precedes a lot of uh, bear markets and downtrends and recessions of things like that. But Santa showed up. Stocks rallied when they were supposed to. Great. First five days of the year, another big one. When that's not up, when they're not coming out of the gates hot, 
Um, that's also not a good sign. And when they do come out of the gates hot, especially as hot as they did this year, great signs historically. We're talking about 80, 85% hit rates off the charts, and the percentage returns for the years are three times uh, what they normally are. And then the January barometer, of course, which is as January goes, so goes the rest of the year. Similar, January is supposed to be good. When it's not, it's usually a problem. But as long as January is good, you know, again, super high hit rates. But it's all three. You've got the Santa Claus rally, the first five days, and you've got the January barometer, all three hitting. And they're, they're at the higher end of the threshold of returns, which also tends to precede some of the greatest years of all time uh, over the next 11 months. So shout out to Jeff Hirsch and his, his old man, Yale Hirsch, uh, founders of the Stock Traders Almanac, you know, who provided this research back in the 1970s uh, and continues to help us to this day. Um, and for those of you wondering, um, you know, the data is easy to find. I mean, it's just math. So Yeah, and Ryan like, Dietrich on Twitter tweets this stuff out all the time. There's a lot of guys that, that tweet, you know, these kind of uh, factoids. Yeah, but it, but the, the almanac, Yale Hirsch yeah, came Yale up Hirsch. with this 50 years ago. So what, one of the Did things that I would Yale like to do or is, his name is that we're going to give credit where it's due, right? Yeah. You know, we talk about VWAP. Brian should know when he's getting the shot out, right? We talk about... We talk about know, scrambled Phil eggs. Phil, Phil gets the sh- scrambled eggs and salt. Phil gets the shot out. Talk about falafels. Howard gets a shot out. <laughs> so, yeah. So January effects in motion. It's really fun. Like, listen, I listen. It's, it's tough as last year was. It's fun to see stocks grow up. I'm very light myself because of my own personal, you know, age and strategy and time. Um, this has been the lightest I've been, but it's still been a great bounce for like my beaten down names that I've held. Um, and I don't want to. So I just, I just want to add one more component yeah, 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 to what Sorry. JC was saying. Yeah. There's also an emotional component that I love yeah. or, a, or a sentimental component. And that is that if you think back to December, uh, what was the sentiment going into the end of the year? Mm-hmm. And so, and what were the forecasts? Because every, every year, uh, the strategists come out of the woodworks with their forecast for next year, which is basically tarot cards, even worse than tarot cards, because they're just relying on their own biases. Uh, their own their own emotions. Oh, the market's been down, so I feel negative. So my forecast is going to be muted, and so I didn't really do much research. I just googled something, and the very first article I pulled up says, "With so much uncertainty about the new year, a cautious outlook seems prudent. Long term trends and investing norms are shifting." And so you know, you got like UB, you know, like all of these forecasts, CF, CFRA, UBS, etc are all have all, all already been met for the s p 500 so right. you know if they're uh forecasting a four percent gain or a 2.9 percent gain for the s p for the year and we're already up six percent and probably more than that after today which looks like the market's rocketing yeah uh where well, do they go from here so they were all <laughs> negative into the end of the year so just you know i'm a takeaway there is forecasting is for the birds Yes. And it's just really based on their biases. I mean, Kamen and Tversky would have said anchoring uh, and, you, you know, anchoring bias is, you know, the emotional aspect of With anchoring the sell bias. side, uh, Pearls, you make obviously great points. I love how the shrink comes right off the bat with the sentence. Dude, it's so important. It. Oh. I, listen, I know we joke around all the time. I've been in the trenches with Phil watching markets for 20 years. No one I love it. Better. No on. one has the so- ability to summarize things better without trading and without being involved and like with authority and makes common sense. I mean, he ran a hedge fund for a long time. So kudos. Phil's been on the opt. Phil knows the markets. Well, I think the true skill is and what I love, what I've learned from Phil and what I'm continuing to learn is watching the markets is, is a, is a, is a joy and a, and a privilege, right? That's one of the big privileges of America is, is prices. Like we can watch them and trade them and talk about them. And it's part of free speech. Prices are free speech. And Phil's, there's two choices. There's the technical side, which JC is a master of. I mean, you really are watching a couple of masters. And then there's the, the, the brain side of it, or the human side of it, which I think is probably more than the technical side of it, right? Like for good investors. I think it's who, part of it. It's part of it. I personally think it's a bigger part because I don't have time for technical. I mean, I have time to read you. I don't have time to read many more. T- I, Krinsky, shout out to Krinsky, also maybe top five people in the world 
talking charts uh, that I think probably I met through you uh, or vice versa. But like, you've got Who's to have. Who's the better golfer, you or Krinsky? He's a good fucking guy. I'm terrible. He's amazing. What about you or Riley? Who's the better golfer? Hands down. It's not even just I, I, I just had a chip off. A chip. I haven't played in a while, and Riley's amazing. We're, we're, I'm not good. Are you saying Riley and Krinsky? Well, rumor was there that I was I good. Was but, yeah. The, uh, but Watching what Riley is doing with intention cool. is yeah. fucking awesome right now. Like, this guy is just going out there, training himself, working hard at it. He just training. took over He's our like Rocky. Event, huh? He's like Rocky drinking the eggs. I love it. I love it. But I'm also always talking him off the ledge, so let's let's be honest. I'm just, let's, Every let's now and then. Free shrinkage. I did. I JC, I did have a question for you, though, regarding that trifecta. When was the last time we saw that? The Larry, data's available. I mean, you could just download mm-hmm. the S&P data and run a spreadsheet. It, it should take you five minutes. And if it, if it takes you longer than that, then you don't know how to use Excel and find someone who does. Uh, well, and I say, like, I guess, like, uh, Ryan Dietrich. Go to the Almanac. Go to the Stock Traders Almanac. Go to the source. He already ran on the numbers for you. Or just use Excel and calculate yourself. Um, what I wanted to talk about with Phil is that he was talking about, you know, sort of that anchoring and stuff like that with Tversky and all that. There's a lot of hurting that takes place there, too, particularly in the sell side, particularly from the strategists, because they have career risk, because – if you're going out on the limb and you're the only one that says buy and everyone's saying sell and you're the only asshole that's wrong, you're going to be looking for a job. And is it worth it? Because you got your cushy payroll and you got your mortgage and you got your kids. You know, you live a nice lifestyle. Is it worth it to go out on the limb, even if you believe that? Or is it safer to just stay with the herd in both reality and in our minds, Phil, right? You know, we're animals at the end of the day and we do feel safer in those herds. But that really comes out in the sell side. You really, really see that. And as market participants, as investors, it's up to us to exploit that. Right? Well, we, exploit saw it, we saw it. With, we saw we saw with our sponsor. Which, so we don't really have a sponsor, even though they are a sponsor. Is we saw it with our sponsor. Remember, it wasn't, listen, we're all part of the uh, hysteria, but you know, three, two, three months before, you couldn't turn on CNBC. Not that I do, but you couldn't see a. You couldn't open Twitter or start just without seeing a clip of Sam on CNBC and they're calling him JP Morgan. They were like fawning over bad. And no one was questioning how stupid the investments were. They were buying broken businesses. Instead, they were calling him JP Morgan uh, right at the top. Like, forgetting we're all made mistakes, but the, it's not just, it's the whole, the whole momentum of it, the whole media, the funnel is just this hysteria right to the top. There was like so many points, whether it was SPACs, like I did a SPAC, there was, it was SPACs, it was GMC, GME, AMC, it was Solana. And it really wasn't until like another six months to a year later to really see the tip of the fraud when CNBC went all in on Sam and Mr. Wonderful went all on Bill Ackman. They all went in, triple down on, on on Sam saying they'd back him again. And, um, you know, so that goes to whatever that complex you were just saying, where people just anchor themselves and triple down. And you only have to double or triple down once and be wrong to just blow yourself up. So if we can, that, that kind of, that's why it feels here is like to try and like save people from themselves because the idea is to stay in the game. The idea is to stay in the game. You know, the only thing I would add to that, and that's perfect, and the, the critical component to that is to look in the mirror. Because if you're talking about this stuff, you're talking about the anchoring bias. And by the way, I just want to give a shout out to Ward Edwards, because Ward Edwards came before Kahneman Tversky. He had this idea that we are conservative, cognitive conservatism. So he's like the OG of the OGs. And so, you know, Kahneman is tipping his hat to Ward Edwards. the OG of OGs. Aaron Beck, it's that's a whole that's a discussion for another day. Aaron Beck was the man, right? This guy was the man, but the, he was a clinical, he was a clinical guy, not a social psychologist guy, which like is all these guys. Cognitive therapy and stuff, right? He was a cognitive therapy guy, right? And 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 he holds the key to how you change. But the key is here is we we talk about these biases and then we point at other people. You know, we were like, oh, look at that guy's being, you know, is anchoring or that guy has confirmation bias or that guy. It's all bullshit. 
what we need to do is we need to look at ourselves and recognize that we, we, you know, we are the enemy of ourselves and that we are as guilty of any of this stuff as anybody else is. Anybody you're pointing a finger at, you just turn that finger around and point it at yourself. For you sure. Know what your limitation is that to way. not recognize it around. Like you and I were walking. Remember, we were walking around in Bethlehem. We were going for a walk and, and you were like that guy, carb face, right? You called it, right? Like you can tell that guy eats a lot of bagels or whatever, right? Remember, right. You, like, it's hard to not, I'll, I'll meet people and I'm like, this guy needs help from Perlman. You know, it, it's quite obvious that they're, you know, right? So it's, and I'm not like calling them out. I'm not like saying anything, but it's impossible to not think about it and recognize it, you know? No, yeah. it's okay. It's okay to see it in others. It's okay to criticize whatever you're going to do and be snarky, be trolly, whatever. But you have to acknowledge that, you know, they're, they're, they're before the grace of God or whatever that line is, that it's you too. And if you don't realize that, you're going to get yourself into all kinds of trouble around markets because it is just a humbling, you know, it's a humbling uh, 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 environment. It's a humbling it's device. It's found health because I'll tell you what, I used to take long walks with them and everything came down to my parents. You always would forgive me because I don't worry, it was your parents' fault. Like psychology is so easy, blame it on your, your Oedipus and your dad. So, all right. So, so moving on, those are some topics that we'll continue to, to chime in on. We've got um, the January effect in place. JC wrapped up. The Fed meeting just happens. We might as well put on record 25 basis point rate hike. Ongoing, Market's ripping. On, it's funny because we've got a rate hike. Ongoing rate increases will be appropriate. Maintaining restric restrictive stance for some time. Economy slows significantly. And like, I don't know, 50, uh, Riley has a chart. It's like, 50% of the public thinks we're the highest likelihood we're ever going to head into a recession of all time, right? Riley, well, I don't know if it's a chart you may want to share, but, and the market's ripping into this. I don't know if we'll continue. I think the market probably sells off over the next few weeks, but oh, there we go. Recession expectations for 2023 are higher than ever. So it's a perfect cocktail for everybody anchoring themselves to the end of the world. And here we are with one of the best Januaries for beating down growth stocks. What's interesting about this year too, JC, is like the stuff that was working is unworking, you know, for, for the most part, energy slowed down. Um, you know, some of the solar rippers are ripping back. Uh, yeah, but the bottom know. line, yeah, but industrials keep ripping, materials keep ripping, financials keep ripping, insurance just closed at new all-time highs. You know, these industrials historically have the highest correlation of all the S&P sectors with the overall market. And it's, Pushing up against new all-time highs. The Dow's only 5 6% from new all-time highs. You've got London, the United Kingdom, literally just closed at a new all-time weekly closing high, all-time weekly monthly closing high. You're seeing expansion from international. All of this started in June. So like people were like, oh, my God, why is the market going up? It's like, bro, have you been looking at the charts upside down or maybe blindfolded? Stocks have been going up since June. This is now, correct me if I'm wrong, month number eight. So, like, if you're, like, wondering why they're going up now, like, where have you been all this time, number one? Number two, a lot of people point to October. They're like, JC, you're crazy. It wasn't June. It was June. They point to October. Fine. There actually was a, a big change in October. In October, the 13th, if I'm not mistaken, that's when it flipped international. Since then, Europe, Japan, emerging markets, those are the leaders, right? That yeah. started in October. And then what do we know about bull markets? What do we know for a fact? You get sector rotation. The laggards catch up to the leaguers versus in bear markets, the leaders catch down to the laggards. In bull markets, the laggards, are they, are they not catching up? What happened this month? NASDAQ growth, communications, the worst stocks on the planet were the leaders. That is sector rotation. Sector rotation is the lifeblood of a bull market. We could pretend it's a bear market. We could pretend stocks are going down, but it's not, and they're not. Well, I think... Yeah, this was not, not even, it was a weird bear market. It was more of a crash, right? It was a crash confined to what was working. It was a behavioral crash because everybody was, had the same trick. You raised more money, you piled it onto Facebook, TikTok, you, you bought ads, you took the VC money that was raised at 0%, you cooked the books, um, you went shot the moon, whatever they call it in hearts that we used to play. Everybody was trying to run the table and be the king. And the rug got pulled, like, you know, uh, and even though it wasn't a liquidity crisis, it was a liquidity crisis in that there was just too much supply right there in 2021, 2022. And even though the fundamentals weren't horrific, they just couldn't support the supply. 
So I think you're right. You know, I wish I uh, had understood the rotation a little better. It is a very hard rotation because tech had worked for so long. And I think, and we'll get into the trends a little, you guys. But now that I can piece things together in hindsight a little bit, even though it's not hindsight, because I think it's going to play out for a long time, tech is no longer just tech. Tech is kind of like the dressing to the salad, right? Tech is in everything. It's kind of infused. It's kind of a garnish. Um, so you're going to get growth without tech, which is, you can spin it, at, you know, you call it industrials. I call it just industrials applying tech and and the other thing we had in, in October, too, is all those all the magazine covers. I'll switch to magazine. We had all those magazine covers calling the dollar wrecking ball. And that that was kind of a peak uh, for the dollar, which has helped a lot of these other trends that you're talking about kind of happen. Right, JC? So the dollar kind of imploded. The dollar is the whole catalyst all along, right? Yeah. So the, the U.S. dollar and stocks and risk assets have had a very strong negative correlation since about 2016. That's when things really spiked. And there's been strong negative correlations and a safe haven status to the dollar in the past, but we're talking about now, and it's been very strong. So when stocks, when the dollar was strong, the dollar bottomed in the spring of 2021, that's when the new 52-week highs list on the NASDAQ peaked. That's when the ARC funds peaked, everything growth, the NASDAQ, the AD line, all that peaked in the first quarter of 2021, and deterioration continued from there as the dollar was strong. And then... In October, like you alluded to, you had Barron's coming out with, you know, uh, the doll- George Washington jumping out of a dollar bill in a tank top with his muscles out. And then Bloomberg Business Week comes out with their can't stop, won't stop for the U.S. dollar. Like, it was ridiculous, right? And what happened immediately after that, the dollar completely collapsed. The dollar is down now four months in a row for the first time since the end of COVID. And if you recall, that sparked the greatest 52-week period in the history of the stock market. So what we're seeing now is exactly like the beginning right after COVID. Is it going to continue into that? Who knows? But the bottom line is, if you are bullish of equities, I think a weaker dollar is not a want, I think is a need. This 2022 reiterated that. When stocks were selling off in in the first half of 2022, were Treasury bonds a safe haven? No. Mm. Treasury bonds got hit even worse. Was yeah. a Japanese yen a safe haven, which traditionally it has been? No. Yen was making 20-year lows. Was gold a safe haven? No. Gold was as useless as ever. The only safe haven was the United States dollar. So the catalyst of a stronger stock market was a weaker dollar. And it's like, well, oh, it comes first, the chicken or the egg. Who gives a shit? When the dollar's going lower, risk assets and equities are, are doing well. Yeah. They're bid, yeah. and we're seeing that. So you could bet that the correlation all of a sudden is going to change tomorrow. And, yeah, maybe it does. Or you can make the bet that we continue to make that the correlation is going to remain strongly negative and a weaker dollar, so stronger euro, stronger pound, stronger EM currencies. If those continue, and they continue to as I speak, I think that will continue to put upside pressure in stocks, regardless of what people say about the Fed or the Trump or the war or whatever people are complaining about today. It's always something. Whatever they're complaining about, I'm focused on the dollar. Yeah, well, the, the dollar trip. My word, I'll let folks chime in. But my word has been constructive, right? I talk. I have. I'm lucky at my stage that I talk to family offices all the time, which is people that manage their own money. And there's nothing better than talking to people that manage their own money because they they're a little more honest um, when they don't have to sell you anything and they're worried about their own money. So they're always going to be probably a little more conservative. So you factor that in. Um, because they don't need to make money unless they're lunatic degenerates. And so, you know, for the last two years of the family office that I dealt with were like, you know, and they, they have their right to be more extra conservative because they're rich. Uh, they were warning. They were like, this is stupid, I, you know, including my own money. I was not writing checks uh, other than schmuck insurance type checks. And the the word of the month, you know, from all the family office check-ins that I have with our LPs has been constructive. Now, that's their term of bullish. Just the same way they're not going to call crash, they'll say, we're ne- you know, we're just high cash. When they get bullish, they say the word constructive. And so I've heard constructive from people that I didn't expect to hear constructive from, which is just basically, in my terminology, rip-roaring bullish because they can put a little money to work, which really can move a lot of things. 
And when they get constructive, especially the older family office money, they move into the like safer type of things. They're not going to move in or they trade in these broken, you know, Kathy Wood type names. So you're seeing all this play out, what JC kind of caught early in June or October of last year. You know, in January, we started to see kind of, the, I think, combined with the psychology that, that Phil's talking about. So it's good. The good. All bad news is good news right now. Spotify is up 20%. It's a favorite company of mine, even though the numbers sucked. You know, there was revenue growth, but they still have the same problems. So it's the same story as last year, except the stock's up 50% uh, from its lows on, on terrible news. Um, and we're back to a market of stocks, which gets me to the next topic quickly, and then we'll get into some headlines or some, some covers on the line with some ideas, but uh, which is equal weighted. I think one of the bigger things that no one's talked about in, I don't know, 15 years, uh, because it was market cap weighted world, uh, is equal weighted. So, JC, like, just quickly brief people on, like, this neglected thought of equal weighted. Well, indexes. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's not quite that simple, right? It's not so much, like, universal because during different times – over the last several decades, the weightings of cap weighted indexes and whatnot have changed over time. Like energy was 20 something percent at one point, and now it, it dropped as low as two, right? Technology was 26 percent. It was much lower. And it's changed over the years in the 80s. Consumer staples were a huge, you know, percentage of, of the weighting of the S&P 500. So things have changed over the years. So I think just as investors in general, I think it's important to understand what's in the indexes that you're looking at. So, for example, a big reason why people are confused and have thought that we've been in a bull market, in a, excuse me, in a bear market over the last eight months, when in fact stocks have been going up this whole time, is because they're looking at an index that has way too much exposure to the only area that's not working, which had been large cap growth before January, obviously, which had been large cap growth. So if you're looking at the S&P 500, it's like, yep, it's a bear market because it's in a downtrend. It's like, well, first of all, the S&P 500 can't be in a bear market. A bear market is a function of the environment, right? The S&P 500 just is one index. A bear market is when more stocks are going down than going up, more stocks are making new lows, more sectors, more countries. That is a bear market. The S&P 500 is one index that can give us some information on what type of environment we're in, but the S&P 500 itself doesn't enter a bear market. Has the S&P been in a downtrend? Yes, but it owns a ton of growth. That's the problem with the S&P yeah. 500, which yeah. was... The reason the S&P 500 was the best house in town for so long was because of all the growth, right? But when growth is out of favor, it's the worst. So it's important to understand. So when you equally weight the market, when you equally weight the sectors, consumer discretionary was the worst performing sector on a cap-weighted basis because it's a ton of Amazon. But when you look at it on an equally weighted basis, consumer discretionary is up 26% since June. What, what bear market is that? Mm-hmm. No, good point. All right. Well, I think we're going to end the rant, the market stuff on that. Let's talk about family, uh, food, life. Bill, what is a tip for us schlubs that sit around the desks? What's the biggest change that someone 20, 30 pounds overweight that has a desk job, like the stuff that you battle, what's the biggest change you can you can get on? Well, there's a, anywhere you start, anywhere that, that, that is easiest for you is a great place to start. Some of the things that you can do right out of the gate are taking a walk every day in the morning, if possible. Uh, that kills multiple birds with one stone. So when you get outside in the morning and you allow yourself to get some sun, that's a circadian rhythm reset that helps you sleep at night. Also, walking is walking in the morning is incredible for you in so many ways. It gives you a chance to connect with nature and to just be in the present for a minute. You know, maybe you just turn off your phone for a second or you don't take it with you. You go for a walk in the morning. So I love that. And it sounds so easy or, you know, pun intended. It sounds so pedestrian, but it's a great one. Uh, the other thing that I would say uh, is to drink less alcohol. That one is just, you know, people, I, I hate to say this, I'm so sorry, 
uh, you know, I know that there's a, a big uh, sort of backlash against people who are preaching, you know, to stop drinking. But drinking, you know, if you're drinking too much, it is a problem, especially as you get older. So if you're, you know, if you're 20, 25, 30 years old, it might not bother you that much. Howard, I know you're drunk all the time. We've talked about this before. Um, you know, you want to, you really want to slow it down. Don't drink. So um, I'm with you. Uh, drinking less is a really, really good thing. Um, breaking a sweat is incredible. Um, not eating as many carbs. So, I mean, I know I throw a bunch at you, but what the, you want to do is you want to start somewhere you can you, start. You talk about portion control, but you, the intermittent fast, you're pretty bullish on still. It's not portion control. It's eating the right things and eating within a window. So if you, you know, if you can stop counting calories forever, if you just eat high protein, low carb foods, a lot of animal proteins, and if you stop eating around seven o'clock at night, seven, seven thirty at night and stop, you know, the, the, the pretzel, 10 o'clock, the 10 PM pretzel or cereal snacking. Like if you cut that out and just eat a lot of like fish, chicken, eggs, beef, uh, steak, uh, you're going to, you're going to be in so much better health. And it goes, here's the other thing. It goes against what everybody says, you know, I mean, the FDA and all that and the food pyramid has been telling us, Hey, eat all of these breads and whole grains. Meanwhile, that's like the worst thing. So it, you know, I mean, there's some of that, but take a walk in the morning, get yourself some sun in the morning. That would be, if I had to say one thing, it would be get yourself outside in the morning, get some sun on your face and take a nice walk and, and turn your phone off while you're doing it. Just incredible, incredible for you, how you feel the whole day, resets your, 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 your inner clock, uh, help you sleep at night better, which is great for you as well. Talk about this like egg thing. Everybody in this group is eating eggs. <laughs> Uh, JC, eggs are great for you. Give me it. Like, what? First, Rocky did it, and then they said it was going to cause you cancer or heart disease. So, why? Everything that you hear from they is just such bullshit, right? Like, people are just telling you all of this stuff. And meanwhile, nobody really, really knows. So, at the end of the day, you don't even listen to me. What you listen to is your own body. But for my money, Eggs is like, you know, there used to be that slogan, what the incredible happened? edible egg, just so healthy. It's just filled with so many nutrients, filled with so much health. And you and, and it's really relatively, even with the price increases, is relatively so inexpensive, so easy to make. They last for a month to six weeks in your fridge. There's just no better food. And, you know, instead of eating two or three, you can eat eight or 10. You know, you eat 10 eggs. And it's, so it's 600 calories. It's like the same as a piece of pizza, one piece of pizza. Meanwhile, that's garbage and eggs are incredibly healthy. Are you, getting, are you loving that, thing. JC? Is that working? I'm going to do it. You know, for me, you know, if I get hungry during the day, I'll just make eight eggs. Like today I had five because we ran out of eggs. That was all we had left. So I had five eggs. But I would have made eight to ten if we had a ton of eggs, which we normally do around here because Instacart's here like on the regular with the many kids as, as, as we have. Uh, and then also I like to do egg washes with uh, chicken, you know, so I'll, uh, you know, uh, you know, dip the chicken in the egg wash and, you know, maybe a little uh, almond flour or something like that. Give it a little how you doing and then put it on the pan. The the egg egg is, is lovely. Incredibly yeah. healthy right there. Yeah. I, what, so Wetzel's pretzels at a son's game at eight o'clock is not a good idea. No, exactly. I Dude, those, those when we, when we were going for, uh, no, man, I can't, I can't, it's just like a drug. I, I, I don't know why, but at a son's game, I got to have the Wetzel's pretzels. When we were going for crepes <laughs> at two in the morning in the village, it, 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 back in the day. I was happier. It was like the worst. It was so good, but it was like the worst thing so we could bad. have been doing for our health. You know, and honestly, I always felt bad after eating that shit. Honestly, it's all about the diet. Horrible. It's all yeah, about nutrition is first. The uh, it's nutrition for server. Right, we're going to end it with a couple magazine covers. There's two that stood out. Uh, the Goldman Sachs. JC had one out here. If we were going to pick a magazine cover, is it the China one? The Barron's China one where they're like, how to invest in China. Seems like not a whore. There's two covers. I think we'll pull them up. How to invest in China now. That It's just doubled off the lows, the tech stocks. Um, Baba's doubled. Uh, or this one, Goldman Sachs. And... You want to know, you want to know that I, I study this a lot. Yeah. And it's funny because I've kind of become like the de facto magazine cover guy. And 
only because in the CMT associations, like, uh, you know, like study guide or whatever, mm-hmm. they put my like comments about the magazine cover. So everybody thinks I'm the magazine cover guy, but I am not for the record. No, People I understand, are- but it is a funny indicator. It's a good indicator. Sometimes. It's great. Now, here's the trick. I've learned a lot. Really, you have to know is you really want to focus on the, on the, uh, on the magazines and newspapers that are not market related. So when inflation's on the cover of Willie Delwich's Milwaukee Tribune or whatever the, or the newspaper is there, you know, the local paper in Milwaukee, we want to pay attention to that, right? When the euro is sinking in the ocean in my grandmother's El Nuevo Herald, and my grandmother's like, oh, you know, uh, falling. I'm like, yo, Perlman, we need to be buying euro like stat. My grandmother's short euro. You know, mm-hmm. like this is real life. And then when you look at the barons, barons in and of itself is not a great contrarian indicator. Only when Barron's is joining other magazines that are saying the same thing, that it can be powerful. So China, isolated alone in Barron's, I put it with too much weight. The Economist, on the other hand, that in isolation is a great fade. Uh, I, I mean, I'm looking to put long positions in Goldman Sachs. No yeah, I mean, they've already I mean, taken, I hate them, they're evil. They've already taken the write down in Marcus. I think they, the one thing that's coming for Goldman, I, I don't own it. But if I were going to fade a magazine cover, that would be mine. Phil will know what you think there. I mean, you don't trade that much, but like you understand the behavioral of this. So we'll, we'll end with that, actually. But for me, the Goldman Sachs thing that scares me is they're Apple's bitch. Apple's coming, not for trading. So at Goldman, that's where Goldman probably rallies is the fact that they can trade this market better than most and make markets. And there's no competition for what they do right now. Everybody's wiped out. Um, like Apple's coming for... Apple's going to take whatever they can from Goldman. They're Apple's bitch on consumer. Uh, they're the new bank. Apple Pay is the new app store. Um, so go, it won't be a straight up, but I agree. That would be my magazine cover. What Goldman, uh, Pearl, what makes these magazines do this? Is it just part of that whole anchoring? Some of it is our perception that we remember the ones that worked. So we mm-hmm. look back. It's a, it's a hindsight thing. Like you look back and you go, oh, there was a top call. Oh, there was a bottom call. Oh, these guys were had a bullish article that was the top. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So some of it is sort of selective, uh, selective memory. Uh, and, you know, and then, and sometimes they're uncanny. So I would say, you know, I would sort of agree with what J, JC was saying in that, yeah, there's some substance to there's some substance to them, but it's more complicated than you think. I mean, I remember seeing one that was like it was a New Yorker cover, and it had like it was like Mosque of the Red Death at the you know near the bottom of a bear market, and meanwhile mm. the market didn't bottom for like another six months. And but yeah. you know people don't remember that. Like if you would have if you would have used that as a bottom indicator and bought the market there you would have lost like another 30% on your money. So I think you have to be careful with them um, uh, and get into the more of the nitty gritty. Like when, you know, when JC was talking about it, I was thinking about, wow, he, exp- you know, he, we go into, we have conversations about uh, uh, RSI and these different types of oscillating indicators all the time. And there's always more nuance to them than I'm ever thinking about, but I rely on JC to kind of tell me about it. There's more nuance to these indicators than just, oh, there's a bullish cover. You know, like when people say, listen, Kramer's right sometimes, you know, so everybody's fading everything Kramer says, but he throws 10,000 things out there. Some of them are right. The ones that are wrong, all the Kramer faders just say immediately, oh, look, he was wrong. Oh, he was wrong. So a lot of it is our own biases that we're bringing to you know, these, these, these types of signals, these types of sort of, Confessions you know, of a street qualitative addict. symbols, signals. Kramer Sturr's book, Confessions of a Street Act, it was great. So I think, good. You know, the ones after that, I never read it, so I can't speak to that. But yeah, that his first, first book was, was great because it was the it. truth. The first book was good because it was all truth. It was like how fucking corrupt he was. And uh, he had a little remorse. And it really, if you read that first book, he had a lot of scams going on. He broke the law around this hedge fund. He had gotten those redemptions and was doubling down on top of those redemptions. So it was a good book because it was like, yeah, you seem like a degenerate. Uh, ever since then, he's been kind of lying about the degenerate that he has been. Um, but people love it. I'm not, you know. Entertainment. 
people, I have very smart friends who just watch them all day. So uh, it is for some people, it's it's media and entertainment and ideas. The uh, teacher's own. Uh, anyways, this has been fun. I think we can definitely do this weekly. Um, I'm excited about. It's been a while that I've been excited, right? Everything felt kind of me too ish. Um, then I started the podcast in 2020. And I'm like, you know, gotta have video. As much as I hate looking at myself on video, I, I watched JC and some of my friends. I think it's bad for you. <laughs> it is bad for me. I agree. I don't like. I just I don't like the way everything comes together without Knut doing sound. But this this Riverside is phenomenal. Hey, eh? it it's a very exciting time when things get wiped out. Yeah. You have bear, the end, you know, the bear markets and end of bear markets are actually a great time because yeah, it's, it's, just, it's all, but you know, it's a, a, a rebirth, you know, the, the rebirth. Phoenix rises. And I, and I look at this, I, I, uh, pull up the Fred Wilson's latest post because Phil and I have been here a hundred times. I like to keep my list of people I follow short. Some people go, how can you only read five people? I'm like, well, if they're consistently right, why would I change things up? Right. Like, you know, one of the people I dropped from my from my reading list is Mark Andreessen. Like, I, I'm a huge fan, but the signal got lost in the noise, right? Like, too much capital, too many wrong calls, too many. Uh, doesn't mean he's not smart, or maybe the smartest, but I I couldn't separate the signal from the the noise anymore. And you use these bad years to clean up your list. That's why we're doing this show. That's why I only listen to a specific few people. Fred came out, uh, if you can pull it up, Riley, and he called it the cleanse, which is so great because Phil, like, he can appreciate this because he's kind of the OG. Um, he said he said he's never done a cleanse, but he, he 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 called it a cleanse, right? He's like, this is the equivalent last year of a cleanse. Like, it had to happen. And he says, you know, things moved too fast. We lost track of what made sense and focus on doing more than thinking everyone's reacting to everyone else, blah, blah, blah. Everybody should go read it because it's a really good, simple explanation. Uh, we all made mistakes. You got to get caught at the top. But, like, if you're bearish right now, you are going. I can, I can feel the street's still pretty bearish. Prices are moving up, you know. Uh, I, I, I'll use raw. I'll give you a couple ideas of like are my proxies that I'm watching. Um, Coinbase and Robinhood. You know, it would be different if it was just company specific. But you can't find two more levered companies to a possible rebound than these two. I mean, Robin Coinbase has already doubled this month uh, from the lows. Robinhood not so much. But you're talking about. This is the way I, I'm watching these two stocks. Obviously, Tesla being one. JC had a great call that I traded off of the one in the teens. I just I'm sold some. In it. Just sold some. I just sold some. You're having a great first. I'm holding it until my margin clerk calls me after the close. But I'm good. But I'm good for a few more minutes. I, I, I look at these and I'm like, I look at the, you know, I'm saying this publicly. I rarely say this publicly. It's like I'm not saying that Robinhood or Coinbase double again from here or, or triple or whatever. But if you think you're going to start the next Robinhood and Coinbase right now, or if you're in a VC thinking, I want to get, you are living in a playbook that is gone. So if you want exposure to the market, go with go with companies that like, yeah, there's execution risk. Coinbase and Robinhood may blow up, but like the playbooks change. They win. You know, FanDuel, DraftKings, you may not like their business, MGM bets. Maybe they all go to business. But if gambling persists, these are going to be three behemoths, and they won't look the same. So this is a time when you got to go back to the survivors, and it could be Airbnb, Uber. Uh, I don't know which are the web two companies that continue to dominate, but they're gonna have no competition because of where rates went and because of no one wants to go through building those, what what you had to go through to build those in a zero interest rate environment. So there's a huge amount of opportunity as Fred's talking about, as Phil's talking about, as JC's talking about. It's not just industrials, but it will be tech because there's just, the moat will be the capital that they, used to build this huge edge. You can't go build Robinhood again. You just can't. And nor would anybody want to go through what, what Robin had to go through to get there. So stop looking for the next, I would tell people, stop looking for the next Apple or the next Coinbase. Sometimes they are the ones that you are looking at. Uh, the charts not may look good. The sentiment not, may not look good. But you have to factor in more than just, um, you know, one point of view. And so there's some beaten down 
financial and tech companies that are going to continue to surprise. But they're not all equal. You know, Zoom won't rally because Microsoft's sitting on their neck uh, versus a Coinbase, which can rally because people who want crypto are going to go with something that's, you know, that they relatively trust. And Phil, last words, anything from you? You know, uh, the one thing that you were making me think about as you were talking was how the one thing that you've done, uh, and I hate to compliment you, but you, I mean, you are you my are. brother, dude. I, I freaking love you. The, the the one thing that you've done that I think that I've learned from and applying it to health is that you always found the smartest people. You're a curator more than anything. Yeah. You found the smartest people and then you listened to what they had to say and you kept listening to what they it, they had to say. And so that's just what you do. Like you find the smartest people and then you listen to them and you integrate what they're saying. Uh, I, I'm doing that in health. There's like five people that I trust in the health there world many. now. There aren't that many, I agree. There aren't that many. There aren't that many. I mean, we were talking about Fred Wilson. You've been reading him forever. You've yeah. been just, you know... Like uh, uh, you know, like like surfing off of his wave for for years for twenty well, because years. Because he reads other smart people, he has a network that I couldn't tap into. Like it's just Dude, he's a genius. Yeah. Well, even if he isn't, he's reading other geniuses, and 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 that's why family offices, as much as we want to hate the rich, uh, they are in a position to do things with their own money and talk their book in a way that other people wouldn't. And that's a very new phenomenon. Family offices used to be five or 10 families. Now there's 10,000 of them and there's going to be a hundred thousand of them. And that's the new hedge fund is the family offices trading your own book. And uh, it's not so much about like how much money I manage. It's about I manage my own money and I make decisions for myself. So I think that's the era we're heading into. Uh, you're living it. JC's living it. Even Riley's living it. So kudos. We'll find a name for the show. I'm not bad. What you, that wasn't bad. That was great, boys. Howie, we before need, we... need a final trade. How do we not... We got to come out... We well, gotta... The final trade... Okay, what? Well, sorry, you're right. One I'm looking at is, because Krinsky brought it up, and it's very against Howard, is, is natural gas. So, JC, give me your thoughts here. I'm waiting to see some strength. This is like a crazy triple standard deviation move into support. He had a pretty good technical piece out on it. It's not a normal trade. I would look at it, but it's up on my screen, natural gas, because uh, just because it's so hated and that support. You know, I mean, listen, if you're looking, you know, to just, you got to, here's the thing. If, here's the thing about fighting trends and looking for mean reversion trends. Number one, try not to do it and try not to make it a habit. That's rule number, on a trend. That's that's rule number one. Rule number two, you better have a good reason to yeah. bottom fish and, and fight a trend. You better have a really good reason. And number three, most importantly, you better have very clear risk management procedures in place. You better know exactly what you're going to do or what the market needs to do to prove that thesis invalid. And I'll reiterate the first thing I said, try not to make this a habit, right? You want to be in the direction yeah. of the underlying trend. Now, if you have to be in natural gas, is sentiment really washed out? It, it's pretty damn close. I think 270 is your level. You know, if you're above 270, if you got to be in it, do it above that. You better be fading four and a half. Uh, yeah. That better, you better be, you know, feeding the ducks up there. It's a low probability trade. It's not what I'm putting on, yeah. uh, but 270 is your level if you got to be in it. Me personally, I like buying strength. I'm buying uh, Boeing as we speak. If Boeing's above 200, I think you own it. I think it goes to 280, 275, 280. Below 200, you can't own Boeing, <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, but I think that's that's a good level. Good. I like that one. You you put out ITA today, so I like that too. That was your that's the index. Look how beautiful that looks. But I like Boeing Boeing better. Of that index, by the way, it's a small component. Rather yeah, than yeah, that's interesting. Phil, so anything that you're looking at? I, mine were Hood and Coinbase. I mean, not so much Coinbase here, but Hood. I just feel like they could surprise. I don't love the the decisions they're making. You know, I don't have any privy to the news. I just don't like them going into media, but like. I'm not in charge there. I don't love that idea, but I just feel like it's still the best product. There's going to be no competitor. Everybody that's a competitor now that's raised a lot of money is a walking dead company. They don't have the capital to go the distance. Uh, I don't play fantasy, but it's the same thought in fantasy. I think they're all shit 
I just hate the whole idea of fantasy and gambling and having 18 year olds gamble parlays. And, but it's so far, no one cares. So I think, like I said, FanDuel, MGM, you know, DraftKings are the winner. And in, in, in investing, it's going to be, like you said, probably Goldman and it's going to be Robinhood Coinbase, whether we like them or not. Um, and that Tesla trade was a hell of a one. So thank you on that. And then, Phil, anything you're looking at? Uh, invest in your relationships, people you love. Oh. Stay close to people you love. No, I got one for you. I got one for you. I got one for you. I mean, that was uh, so perfect. That was, no, that was. Calmaine Foods. Long the eggs. Long eggs. Calmaine Foods is the largest producer of eggs in the universe. Calm, ticker calm, above 60 with a stop at 60. So you don't want to you don't want to let it get away from you. I'm not a guy who recommends individual stocks. As a matter of fact, my best recommendation is probably just get Nick's book. Just keep buying and read that because you just buy a little bit of low cost uh, ETFs every every month forever. That's really probably the best. But if you have to be a gambler, if you have to be crazy, and you want to listen to a guy like me, Calm is the largest producer of eggs. Calmaine Foods. The chart's been going – chart rallied like crazy. Now it's been going sideways. Uh, above – I own a little bit, but above – are we allowed to say that? I guess I'm allowed to say that. Above 60 – I don't know. JC, you tell me. You, you, you're going to know the entry on this better than me. But I think there's a wave. I think there's – this is for me as a hedge because I spend money on eggs. Uh, so I'm going to own a little bit of it. But I think above 60 with a stop around 60. This thing breaks out. It had a false breakout about a month ago. But it stayed in the range. Uh, you're going to be able to find an entry and exit. Just control your risk. Don't be an idiot. If it breaks down under this channel, don't stay in it. Bill Perlman, the technician, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, you, the technician. Do you, guys, do you guys manscape? Do the boys manscape? Are these are these six month old babies manscaping yet? They are three months old. Three months old yesterday. Actually, they are not manscaping. Well, that's but they have that's a, what's your name? Put olive oil on their head and clean the cross on their head. Bill, do you manscape? Are the boys manscaping? Dude, I'm the most I'm I'm a I'm very poorly groomed. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I just got I got hair coming out of everywhere except the top of my head. You're looking good. All right. So uh staying healthy, that's that that gets you halfway there, but I'm still I really want to do this show. I want to drop fifteen while we're live here. Dude, I got you, bro. Yeah. This I got is you. A, part of this is an experiment. JC looks great. Uh I think you're helping Riley. Riley looks great. I'm happy for Riley. Dude, did you see Riley doing pull-ups the other day? I think the person doing worse here is me, and I was the guy that was leading the charge with cycling. So I've got to, I've got to, I got to, I got to toughen up around this. Dude, one. I so got you. Howard, like Phil said, I'm at Howard's house a couple Riley's weeks gonna, ago. Riley's going to get me back in golf. This is a cool product. I'm out at Howard's house a couple weeks ago, out on Coronado, and he's freaking just piling donuts. Did I? Just, oh, pi- yeah. just. just yeah. Piling, he's got, he, you know, like he's got donuts for like his little nephews or something, little niece and nephew, and he's just, he's just like, yeah, knocks one of them down. He knocks the two year old down to get the freaking donut. <laughs> and I had a wagyu burger that day. All right, everybody, the uh, JC, Phil, Riley, Howie, my little unicorn, my little guy in the back with all his little equipment. We'll get to that guy next. So that's a work of art right there behind me. My first piece of art uh, that I ever bought. When I was in college, and uh, it just continues to go up in price. So we'll get into some of this other stuff. I wanted to talk about content. Uh, but anyways, thanks, boys. This was fun. Riley, thanks Adios. for doing this. We'll get this out live. Thanks, yeah. I can just trade while we do this. This is what I'm going to do. Nice trade. Nice trade. Yeah, are you kidding me? Great trade. Okay. Cheers, Eight grand, episode one. We'll take it. Nice. nice. All right, so-